My name is Eric Van Horn. I bought my first franchise in my 20s, and since then, I've owned six brands with 25 stores in eight states. I've also helped a thousand people find the right franchise for them. People like us who are not cut out for the nine to five and like to work smarter, not harder. How do we find the right franchise, buy it, grow it, sell it, and how do we do it in a way to own the business without it owning us? Those are the questions, and I'm on a mission to give you the answers. Welcome to Franchise Secrets. Welcome to the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Eric Van Horn here with today's guest, Stephen Vareb. Now, uh, Stephen is a multi-unit, multi-brand franchisee, has been for many years, and we first met at a convention. I don't know if you remember, Stephen, but there was a convention that we were at with Yoga Six, Mm -hmm. and there was a special dinner that our mutual friend, Brian Holmes, put on, and um, that's when I first got to know you and your business partner, Henry, and I'd known about you guys, but never actually got a chance to meet you guys. And then since then, like we've gotten to be friends. You've joined the franchise tribe mastermind and, you know, you've gotten involved there, helped you get involved with some of my connections in different places. And, and, um, you know, you're just a big contributor to the franchise community. And so I've been wanting to get you on here to talk about your story and your partnership and franchise in general. So welcome to the show. Thanks, man. Appreciate you having me. Definitely. Now, give the audience a uh, a bit of your background, like just you know, a, a ninety second. Like, how did you get to where you are? If you can do it in ninety seconds. Wow. All right. Let's see. It's it's a tough one. Let's see here. Uh, story. I went to Penn State University. Found myself in Charlotte, North Carolina, accidentally in mortgage banking. Worked for a bank called Norwest Mortgage, and we acquired Wells Fargo. Kept the name was in the back end of banking, loss mitigation type stuff. Um, Good experience for things like right now that are going on in the world. From there, took a relocation. I was recruited by a company named Freddie Mac, which is one of the largest real estate investors uh, in the world. And did that for a couple of years, then moved over to the data side where I sold public record information for a company named Choice Point. Did that for seven years. And a buddy I grew up playing ice hockey with said, why are you a corporate guy? You're not a corporate guy. You're an entrepreneur. And I'd never heard that before. I didn't really know where that came from, but he knew me since I was six years old playing ice hockey. And he just said, you have all the skills and tools to to be an entrepreneur. That's something you should do. And one of my coworkers at the time had asked me if I was a reader. I said, you know, Sports Illustrated, Sporting News, absolutely. (laughs) And uh, she said, not what I meant. But I think with your real estate background, you might enjoy these books. And she handed me a copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. And I was, I was hooked. It was, uh, I, I never knew that I could enjoy reading so much. And at that point, you know, if you were to look in my library at this point, I would swear almost every book he put out, I, I would just, I would hammer through very quickly. And just love that he broke it down into a simple context and that's where I kind of came across franchising and the fast track, if you will. You ever played that board game, his board yep. game, Cash Flow 101? Yep. yep, I have it. I still have it. it they're one of the best, what it was like 200 bucks for that game. And people look at me like, <laughs> you paid 200 bucks for a board game? I'm like, I know, I can't believe it either. But every time I play to this day, I learn something new because there's a different strategy yep. you, have to, you have to deploy. And uh, I highly recommend it for folks thinking about being an entrepreneur or even current entrepreneurs, because it just gets your brain moving in yep. different directions, you know? Dude, that's one of the things I want to talk about is how to get that brain moving in different directions. Because even as you're an entrepreneur and you are in the game, it is so easy to just get into your own little world and, and not kind of expand your mind, expand your thinking with others. So I want to talk to, to you about that at some point. What was the transition? From, you know, you said you started a fast track into the franchise world. What is that fast track? What did that look like? At that time, when I was still in corporate America, when I took the reload, they had one of those reload packages where I could, um, they were going to pay my closing costs on, on the house if I bought one. And it expired within a year. And I didn't know anything about Northern Virginia. All I knew is the cost of a townhouse was the same or probably more than the cost that my parents paid for their you know four bedroom two bath house on 14 acres of land in erie pennsylvania which is where i grew up 
And I was scared, you know, to take on that mm-hmm. kind of debt. And like, what was I, 27, 28 years old, I think, and, and to buy my first house, single guy. But I did. And as I was living there, it was when I was reading the Rich Dad Poor Dad book. And I thought, you know what? I could rent this place based on what rental market is. And I just kind of started to poke around and buy another one and, and kind of do it one, onesie twosie style. And that's basically what I, what I employed. And then when the market just went crazy, you know, in the 2000 to 2004 time period, I ended up renting that out, buying another house and I sold it because you could do that whole living it for two of the last five years, take the, take it game yep. free. And I ended up with, you know, a couple hundred grand that I didn't anticipate. And I'm going, this could be my fast track money. So I made some really bad investments with the first half of that 200 grand <laughs> lessons learned, you know, street, street MBA real fast. Yep. And uh, I took the other like 90 grand or whatever. And I bought three massage envy licenses uh, with Henry Kim, my business partner. And that's basically where we got started. So I, I really got lucky in terms of hitting the real estate market at the right time, cashing in and pushing it forward into franchising. And at that time, when I had met Henry, Henry is the brother-in-law of a guy that I was working with in corporate America. And um, Henry and I knew each other just from like birthday parties and mm-hmm. whatnot. And he had been looking at franchising. He found Massage Envy. And he he wasn't in a position to quit his corporate job yet. but. Um, I was, you know, being from Erie, Pennsylvania, pretty conservative dude, saved all my commission checks and whatnot. And uh, I said, look, I was going to do something different anyway. And let's just have me run it. I'll be the manager and I'll build, we'll build a comp plan just like we would pay our manager, you know, when we have one. That way I can work through the mechanics and make sure it's legit and see what kind of bonus can be earned based on these KPIs. And that's what we did. We opened our first Massage Envy December 2007. How many do you have now? Six. Six. And now. you got a pretty, and how many people do you have working for you? That's a good question. You know, it's well, I was on, go- I was on with your team and you had people from all over the place. I was on a Zoom call <laughs> with you, with your team talking right. about sales stuff, but you have a pretty big team. It's not a small little operation. Yeah, I want to go back to sure. the friend that kind of planted the idea said, Stephen, you're an entrepreneur. Did this friend of yours come from an entrepreneurial background, his parents entrepreneurs, or like, did that just come out of left field? It was, it was out of left field. You know, um, this was a kid, he was my goaltender since I was six, seven years old playing ice hockey. And we played together from that time all the way through prep school. So we were pretty close to one of those brothership, you know, brotherhood mm-hmm. kind of things where they, they just tell you without worrying about hurting feelings or anything. Yep. He had left after high school. We ended up going out to California, went to Pepperdine. And uh, well, after he played hockey in college, then he went out to California. And he stumbled into some business type settings. And he was in the um, hedge fund arena, doing all kind of crazy business stuff. And he kind of fell off the face of the earth for a while. And then he, he reemerged because this was before social media and texting mm-hmm. and cell phones, not to yep. date myself. You know, but, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, you look back and go, how did I meet? my friends at college football games without text messaging and stuff. You know, it's like, meet by that telephone pole at this time. If you're not there, we're going in without you. Yeah. <laughs> Back in the olden days. And uh, so just in a conversation with Jay and talking, uh, you know, business with him, he had had some business background and some experience in that world. He had not really been too much from, from you know, cut from that cloth growing up in Erie, Pennsylvania, but um, he learned a lot of it being out in that, LA Malibu area and Mm -hmm. seeing that life and he just told me you know hey with your leadership you know skills that you developed you know growing up playing hockey and whatnot he just really felt that that was more my cup of tea than being a rank and file you know corporate sales guy with a number on my back every day it's interesting because it's just a comment that was made but it resonated and so many times we can just people make comments or introduce us to something an idea a thing a person and it's so easy to dismiss it and, and not catch it and, and grab a hold of it. But I want to dive now into your partnership with Henry. The reason is because I, I like that model. I like when two people come together, one person doesn't, can't, won't be the person that is overseeing the business day to day. 
because there really should just be one person that is that that point of of contact, whether that's an owner, a manager, or whatever. There still needs to be that organizational structure. But I like it when somebody that when there's a partnership like that. And I know that there are people listening to this podcast because they call me, they talk to me because they're thinking about getting into business. And one of the things that people ask me is, Eric, I still have a corporate job, or I have another business, or I'm like this. And I don't have the time to invest in time into the business. And then other people are saying, Eric, I've got hustle. I've got a successful track record. I'm ready to start my business, but I don't want to do it alone. Can't do it alone. Won't do it alone for whatever reason. But if I could just be a matchmaker of those two avatars, then I could put them together. There's probably going to be some good business opportunities for them. And I've seen that happen. There's somebody in our mastermind that started a, a window washing business. One's a, an existing franchisee. And then he had somebody that is a, that a nephew that's in college. They combined forces and they're doing like what you did. So give me, go back in time to where your mindset was with that and, and where Henry's mindset was. So that way you can help people that are on both sides of it kind of unpack the value and the, and, and how you guys did that and why you guys did that. My mindset, <laughs> probably not too unlike other folks in corporate America. And if you read the rich dad, poor dad books, it's really a matter of what's your definition of risk or what's your definition of security. And a lot of folks think a corporate job is one of security. The rich dad premise was, you know, when your fate is in the hands of someone else, that that's not necessarily a secure position to be in. And the more I read about that, it, like you said, you know, someone plants an idea in your head and it, it just makes you pivot and think from a different perspective. And growing up in a small town like Erie, Pennsylvania, with folks that built locomotives in a factory, that mentality was all about you give your time to a company, you know, for 30 years and you invest in your 401k and, you know, you get to 65 years old, you retire and you've got a nice nest egg and you can, you know, live your golden years out. And so as a kid, you're just, you follow that template because you respect your parents and, and those are the folks that are kind of guiding you with those decisions. And so it's tough to see the world in a different light at that point. And so with these, these folks kind of planting these seeds in my head and looking at my landscape at corporate America going each year I hit my number, it, it just gets bigger next year. And eventually mm -hmm. it's a Peter principle that I don't have control over. I can't say, Hey guys, it's cool. I, I'm doing just fine. I don't need you know, that commission check, I'm just going to coast. And I like the clients I have. I don't need to go get new ones. It, that doesn't work well in corporate sales. And it ultimately becomes a, a real burnout. And when the franchise thing came up, I was like, you know what? How much money do I really need to make to be happy? Mm -hmm. What does happiness mean to me? It, it really kind of prompts some soul searching and the whole thoughts of creating passive income and passive cash flow so that you're, you're over time, you know, my, my dad used to tease me. He was a tool and die guy. And he said a comment one time, he says, I'm paid for what I know, not what I do. Mm -hmm. And as a kid, I didn't really quite get that. I'm like, well, you go to a factory every day or something to get me paid for that. Right. Yep. So, but that always resonated with me. And with the franchise aspect, I just thought, you know what, it's going to take some grinding you know, I'm going to be there every day. I mean, there were 14 hour days. There were days of people calling in and therapists not showing up to, to work when they said they were going to. And these were things that were very, very foreign to me. I didn't understand how people would just not show up to work and not call and tell you and then show up a day later as if nothing was wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't know what planet you live on, but this is not where I'm from, you know? So it was hard, you know, folks thinking about franchising, just like with our team, I, I try to coach and tell our managers and our folks running our businesses, set the expectation right out of the gate. I think a lot of people just try to sell for the sake of selling or filling a position or, oh, I got to get that headcount filled. I got to get somebody in here for training. And if, if they think that it's going to be something and they realize it's another, then you just wasted two weeks, four weeks, two months of time. Well, let's go there. Let's go. Franchising isn't easy. Semi-absentee ownership is not easy. And making the right hires is not easy. And being upfront with them on what it is and not just selling them on some, all of it. Franchisees should not be sold a pipe dream. 
franchisees, business owners should not like tell their, their future employees something that it's not going to be. It needs to be like, I'm a fan and like you of just being very realistic on what it is and what it's not. And I was just talking to somebody the other day. To, um, he is working for somebody, but he felt like, he's like, Eric, I, what I got into was oversold to me as a job position. He was, it was oversold. And I wish they would have just been upfront with me on that. And then on the flip side, he has somebody else that he's working for, who's a friend of mine. And he said, Eric, I love how this person was very upfront. He's like, we're going to try this. We're going to do this. I'm going to pay you. I'm only going to pay you this much. If this thing hits like we think it's going to, you're going to go on this ride with me. And if it doesn't, you're going to be out of a job. <laughs> you know? But it's that type of communication that I think we should be having with our employees. So it's kind of like what you're talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And one of your podcasts with Cameron Harold, I, I loved it. He, he says, I think it was back, in, it might've been in the junk days or something different, but he said he would tell people point blank, if I make you this job offer, he said, I'd look them straight in the eye. If I make you this job offer, and if you accept it, you're basically telling me that you're committing to me to be with us for two years because that is the amount of time and effort that it's going to take in order for both of us to be successful for what we're trying to accomplish. And if you tell me you're going to be here and you leave within two years, I'm going to find you and I'm going to chase you down with a baseball bat. And I remember driving where I was, I was cracking up because I went in and I said that story to you know a few new lash stylists, but I changed it from a baseball bat to a hockey stick. I made it my own. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, I told my hiring managers, I told them, I said, I want you to talk like this. I want you to let them know because we are absolutely committed to them and their success. But you have to tell them it's a hard job. You can absolutely earn 60,000, 70,000, 80, 90. Some folks as master stylists in our lash business can earn up to $100,000 a year as a cosmetologist or esthetician. Just like in franchising, you can make 100,000 a year. You can make a million a year, but it really comes down to what is it that you want to do and what is the amount of effort you're willing to put in, in into the areas that need to have that effort put in in order to get wherever you want to go? Dude, um, I love that because so much of it's on us as a franchisee and there's a system. The system has to be, the system has to be, if there's somebody making a million dollars in a system, there's no reason I can't make a million or you can't make a million. You know, <laughs> you need to find that the ceiling there, collaborate with that person and, and become like that person. But if nobody's making any money in it, then like stop wasting your time. And I've been a part of both. <laughs> I've been a part of franchises that are both. Not everything is rosy out there in the franchise world, in the business world, and in the job market world either. How did you go and become a, a really top performer? Was, was it just luck? Or how did you target that and go after that? You know, great question. I, I would say luck. So I'll follow up with that to how can you become more lucky? So keep going. Yeah. So, and, and this is the quote that will, I think, answer that question. I think it was Rain, Wayne Gretzky. And he said, the harder I work, the luckier I get. Growing up with a, with a work ethic from factory working parents, you know, you saw it every day you saw the dedication you know you saw the dirt on the clothes when they'd come home at the end of the day so you knew that that some type of hard work was going into it and taking that type of determination and going you know what i might not have to come home with, with dirt on my clothes but i got to become i got to come home mentally tired and know that that i gave it my my best and managing people which is the businesses that henry and i continue to find ourselves in Managing big teams of people is exhausting because you've got tons of different backgrounds and tons of different egos and creativities and sensitivities and <laughs> and it's not a one size fits all ever. And why do you uh, choose know, hard businesses, man? Why do you choose hard businesses? <laughs> no, that, no, that's good though. I mean, it's because if it were easy, anybody could do it. That's exactly. another one of the things I tell my people. I'm like, look, I know this is hard, but if it was easy, then anybody could be anybody could do it. Do you want to be anybody or do you want to be somebody special? You know, it's so true. I mean, it, you know, we have a choice in the roofing franchise that, that I just started Mighty Dog Roofing. 
who are we targeting? Like, are we going after the semi-absentee owner, the person that wants to put a manager in place and, and not have to worry about the business? And there are franchises out there that are like that. Sola, salons, when I was in that business, that was very much a semi-absentee ownership model because it's been, there's a lot of people that were doing it semi-absentee. And that's how you can tell, if a, by just a quick little note, if a franchise says they're semi-absentee, don't take their word for it. Find out if they're semi-absentee by talking to franchisees who started out with that franchise semi-absentee. That's how you know. It's never, ever, ever as easy to do semi-absentee as we think it is. Back to the roofing franchise. We were, tr we were trying to define who we want as a franchisee in terms of what are they going to put into the business. And it was clear to us, we are not going after the semi-absentee mindset franchisee, which is how my mindset is most of the time. But it's going to be the person that you just described that wants a lifestyle, that wants some freedom and flexibility, but also wants to build a big business. And, and they have to have that work ethic and they have to have the drive to be able to build a team, get customers and do all of that. The more I talk to people, the less I see people correlate work. They want something for nothing, Stephen. They want the, what you and I have right now, but they don't want to put in the work that you and I have put in. And, and I'm the same way. My dad had a fencing company, fencing and seating, did, did commercial projects. And I remember being out there when I was a young kid uh, working hard. And it got, it, that's what drove me to get into business because I was fine working hard. But I did not want to work with my hands all the time because I, I just, I did not want to do that. But I think anybody out there thinking about getting into business or if your business isn't going as well as it, as it should be, you need to get in there and do the work. I mean, there, there's nothing that really replaces that. Now, I'm a huge fan of working smart. I know you are too. So it's not, just, so how did you transition from just like the hours and the effort to like starting to work smarter in your business? Yeah, great question. So the very first year, I say it was about 12 months that I was the general manager of the first massage envy that we opened. And my sister, Michelle, was my assistant manager, uh, which was cool. You know, there's, there's a decade of uh, gap between uh, my sister and I. So I was gone and out of the house at Penn State while she was, you know, 10 years old going into fifth grade and whatnot. Um, <laughs> I don't even know if that math works, but it was something. Like I was trying that, to think know. if it worked. It's pretty it was close. Like third actually. grade, actually. <laughs> no, no. Now you get. Now you're. Now you're off. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was, but but nevertheless, I didn't really know her. She didn't really know me, and she was at home trying to figure out her life, living on my parents' couch. I said, "You know, you've got some." She was working as an assistant manager at Wendy's, and I said, "Listen, you've got more retail experience than me. Come down here and open this business with me." And, and let's see what we can do together. And she came down and she lived with, with me. And um, I had a one-year-old daughter at the time. And uh, she and I, we would work our tails off all day. And that was where the foundation and our culture. And, and we, had, we happened to be very lucky to have an amazing training team at Massage Envy at the time, led by a woman named Susan Langrack that taught me more about building culture and mm. customer service and how to treat employees first and, and worry about the customer second, just tremendous. Anybody out there that needs a training consultant, she'll punch me for doing this because she has too much work already. But Susan Landgraf, look her up. So that was the first year. And then the hardest part is probably like a parent going from that first kid to the second kid. And you're not as tough on the first kid, but you still want to be, you know, strict and keep them in the lanes. And so having a second general manager and me moving from being the manager, being in control, having things just so in the way I wanted them to set the foundation and then opening the second location, knowing I couldn't be two places at once. Now I'm managing, you know, I'm managing the managers. That was hard. And that was a lot of phone calls, you know, back and forth with Henry and him trying to talk me off the ledge. Cause he's like, there's a quote I have on my calendar right now. It's uh, it's progress, not perfection. And when you're driving for perfection, you burn yourself out, you burn your team out, nothing's ever good enough. You know, they internalize that they're never going to make you happy. And it's not a good situation or setting for anybody. And that was probably the biggest learning lesson going from one to two, starting to trust my people and being satisfied that, that sometimes good is going to have to be good enough because it's never, ever going to be exactly the way that you want it. And that was my first lesson in scaling at that point 
point once I learned that lesson, then it was like, well, let's open number three, number four, five. How much six. easier was number three and four versus number two? Easier for sure, because at that point, you, you've somewhat trained yourself to know that it's not going to be just right. And just so you got to keep on coaching. And then my development changed. My development went from managing every single person in the facility and getting involved in, in every single situation to being a coach and, and trying to coach our managers and do some role plays and, you know, do some of that kind of thing to equip them with the tools and let them fail and, and figure out how to succeed. It's absolutely storytelling of things that they can, that will resonate with them is, is what I found. And one of my favorite stories about that was some type of a, um, there was a contest to fly a single piloted aircraft across the English channel and it was self-propelled. And for 13 years, I believe it was, you know, there's like a million dollar prize and people kept crashing. They, they didn't make it. And somebody came along and said, you know what, I'm going to give that a try. And they failed for four years in a row as well, but they figured out by studying everybody else's mistakes, they figured out that they would build an aircraft that when it did crash, they didn't go into it thinking I'm not going to crash. They went into it going, I'm going to crash. So let's build an aircraft that doesn't completely disintegrate when it hits the ground. So we can just kind of <laughs> pick the chassis back up and try a couple modifications. So they failed just as many times as everybody before them. They just got mm -hmm. four bites at the apple a year. And so within four years, basically, they won the prize they got across. And I told my teams, and like the moral of that story is, you're going to fail. And that's okay. Just do it quickly. Don't, don't sit around looking at the carnage. Get up dust yourself off, do it again, keep trying, do it a different way. And, and I would always follow that up. I said, because in life, the way you build wealth is with an acronym called OPM. It's other people's money and it's other people's mistakes. You put those two together and, and, and you're, you will be as successful as you want to be. That's one of the reasons I started that mastermind, the, the Z Tribe mastermind. I've learned so much from other people's mistakes. And then I started to join other masterminds around the country that are, don't have anything to do with franchising. One was in marketing and one's around a lot of online businesses and, and entrepreneurs that have built significant technology companies. And I felt like I was at the top of the game in franchising in terms of the people that I was around. We were all friends. So I needed to get outside of franchising to start learning from people. And then I got back into the franchise world in terms of, of, of meeting with some um, A players. And I'm nowhere near the top of the game. I am nowhere near the top of the Humbling, game. Right? I didn't know how to get them. I didn't know how to be around them in both worlds, the non-franchise world and the franchise world until I found a way to be around A players. Uh, that's why I got into these different masterminds. And that's why I started the franchisee mastermind is so we can learn the OPM, other people's mistakes, because we've all have made mistakes, significant mistakes at, and, at, at times. And if we can learn from other people, oh my gosh, it just puts us at such an advantage. So you joined the Franchise Tribe Mastermind. And if anyone's interested in that, it's the ztribemastermind.com, ztribemastermind.com. So I love having you in there. I, I, can't have, I can't play favorites, but if I did have favorites, like you are one of the favorites in there because you give so much and you take so much from it too. Like, like what you're wearing right now is a front row dad's hat. And that's a now mutual friend of ours, John Roman, who started that for dads and, and husbands. And that's been incredible. You got introduced to another uh, buddy of mine, now a buddy of yours. So can you just, um, for those of the franchisees out there, it doesn't have to be just about the mastermind, but why did you join the mastermind? I want to understand that first. Like, why did you join it? That's a great question. And it there's a lot of multifaceted answers to that one. We haven't talked about this. So you go wherever you want. There's no right or wrong. I'm like just interested. You know, so I'll start with, you know, falling on my sword without going into, uh, you know, one of the things with Roman's podcast, John Roman, Front Row Dads, he, he had a doctor on, uh, Dr. Rush. And he so eloquently stated at the beginning of the podcast how, his life didn't exactly turn out the way he thought it was going to turn out. And, and that involved 
a dissolution of his marriage. And after that happens, I don't think anybody can plan for what that really does for you uh, mentally or, or emotionally. And so for me, my path was, you know, the, the massage envy, the franchise, it was kind of a rocket ship. We had a lot of success. Boom, I had three daughters, you know, twins after the other ones. So now I've got a 14-year-old and two 10-year-olds and uh, things were sailing along. And, and then the marriage melted down. And then it really became a introversion. I don't trust anybody because it didn't work out the way you thought it was going to work out. You had talked about my partnership with Henry, which is a very unique one. Um, you know, I was the leader of our business. I was the face. I was the guy that had my fingers in every pile, every pot I was involved. And one day I went to Henry and I said, dude, my marriage is, is falling apart and I got to step back and figure this out. And to tell you the dude that Henry is, he was like, okay, so tell me if you didn't look at your inbox for a week and you had to go in and sort it out. Tell me what the most important things would be and what I need to attack first, you know, and, and it wasn't that Henry was never involved in the business up to that point. He was, but I was a control freak. So I kept him out of everything. <laughs> I was like, here, <laughs> you go handle marketing, stay out of my way. I, I got everything exactly where I want it. Don't mess anything up, you know? And, and Henry, he let me go off and do what I needed to do to get refocused. And when I came back, was right around the time that we were starting to look at this yoga six thing. And when I had met y'all out at the Vegas conference was when I was really kind of reemerging on the business scene. And, you know, I'd met you, I'd heard about you. We, we had similar circles, but I had not actually come in contact or met you. And, and hearing the stories, you know, seeing you, I was like, I think that dude's too good to be true. I should not trust that guy. It was my, it was my first instinct, right? And on my first instincts, my entire life had typically been right. And the more I, I was around you, the more I was around the folks you interacted with, I was like, I was dead wrong. And it, so, it was, <laughs> so you don't know this. This is probably the first time you might be hearing this side of me. But someone had asked me at one point in time, they're like, well, Eric told me I should look at this franchise. And, you know, I also have some distrust for, for franchisors at times. <laughs> so, as, as you should. <laughs> so I'm going, well, Eric told you about that. And this franchisor, you know, I'm not sure. And I was like, I don't know. And the more due diligence I had done and been around you, I went back to this person. I said, I want to tell you, I was dead wrong. And Eric is legit. He is the dude that, that you see and you think he is. And, and probably even better. And at that point, I want to thank you because I started, you know, combination of you and meeting some other people like you, combination of meditation, you know, a lot of other things that all kind of started to, the clouds started to dissipate. And I just got really inspired during that time. And then that led into COVID, which it was roll up the sleeves and figure out how to keep everything afloat and build relationships and get into those groups. because. Henry and I always made it a point to be friends with the top 10, top 20% performers in the brands that we were in. But we had never thought about going outside of our brands that we're involved in. And, you know, when, once we met you and, and then we started listening to some of the podcasts and, you know, and, I, and to, to that point, I listen to you and Holmes every single morning when I'm walking my dog. <laughs> and it starts my day off because it makes me laugh. It makes me think and it just promotes thought. And I feel like I'm networking because I'm getting to know these other franchisees to, to take a page from Justin Donald, you know, one of the mm -hmm. guys that, that, you know, you've introduced me to, to that network. He's a huge proponent of, of networking and taking people to coffee or picking up the phone and whatnot. So, you know, I, I joined your franchise, the tribe and Henry and I actually just joined the Justin Donald Investor Series one. Mm -hmm. And so as, as much as I want to thank you, you know, I'm also not happy with you because I've spent more money on, on masterminds <laughs> than my Penn State education cost me. Uh, <laughs> but it, it really has been great. And, and the networking and working with people that are all trying to solve similar problems and have a network of their own and Rolodex of vendors of who's helped them solve this. And 
it's been really, really refreshing. And, and franchisees are a unique bunch of helpful people. That's so true. And, and I think, and it is, there's a, and we should be distrusting out there. I'm distrusting of a lot of what I see. And that's why, you know, gosh, looking back, that's why I joined masterminds to begin with, because I did not know who was legit and who wasn't in the marketing world. And you look on Facebook and everybody has a jet and a Lamborghini. And so you got to think that they're, they're successful. They might be successful, but are they legit? And are they going to, are they, do they have a heart to help? And are they good at actually helping? And so I joined a mastermind so I could get on the inside to understand who's legit and who's not. And that's one of the, I think that's one of the, the values of being a part of a group of trusted individuals where you get to know them, they get to know you. And now a, a recommendation from somebody in that group is, now means a lot more than just seeing some ad on Facebook or, or hearing about it some, some way because there, there's trust that goes into that. So that's, that was huge for me too when I first got into, into masterminds. And I mean, you and I have done investments together now, you know, where <laughs> you wired a lot of money into, a, into an account that I didn't, I just put it out there for people. And my goodness, over a million dollars came in in, in, uh, in less than a week. And we wired that out and we bought, uh, we're part of a group that bought Pier 1 imports out of bankruptcy. Yeah. And that opened up a whole nother world to us. So guys, if you're thinking about, um, well, you, let's go back to, you were, would always associate with the top 10, 20% of, and when you're in a certain brand and everybody should be doing that. At the very least, everybody out there should be, well, you tell them what they should be doing, Stephen. I mean, what should they be doing to, to get around the top 10%? And, and even if they're new or they've, or they are not, let's say they are a middle or bottom performer, what advice would you give them? Well, first, before I go there, I just want to say that the, to go back to the Pier 1 import story, I, I just want all of your listeners to know that that's actually a tribute to you. It was an overnight thing. It was, uh, you, you said something on the Facebook group the one day, hey, you know, I did this dress barn deal and there's another one coming up. If you guys are interested, let me know. And then we got some type of a, you know, a podcast that lasted for, you know, a Zoom call that was like an hour long with a one pager on how much to send and what the return would be. And, you know, I remember walking the dog, seeing one of my buddies who's a, you know, company controller for a big marketing company. And I told him about it and, and he's like, oh, you got to be careful. That sounds like a scam. And, you know, and, and if, it, if it hadn't been for you, I would have thought it was a scam too. I'm like, no, you got to understand. I know this guy. And, and he's like, uh huh, yeah. So, you know, the fact that we all wrote these checks and within a couple of days with very minimal due diligence, and the fact that there's not a lot of precedence for buying companies out of bankruptcy and taking it to an e commerce platform, yep. it was a leap of faith. But the leap of faith started with you because we believed in and we trusted you and your network. And we knew that if you put it out there, that it was your brand your personal brand. And if we sent you money, you were going to be a good steward of it. And you were going to make sure that it, all the eyes were dotted and teeth were crossed. And next thing you know, you got flooded with all these checks for like a million bucks. Like, and I saw the, the agreement come through and, you know, I see the names on there and some people I knew, some people I didn't, some people I met through you and it's pretty cool. Um, so it is. And I think, Oh yeah, for sure. And, and like, my heart behind it was just to, uh, like, I get these opportunities that I didn't have these opportunities two years ago. And I know a lot of nobody else in the group had these opportunities today. And you've just got to be giving, you got to be a part of groups and around people that are giving and not, not just taking. So I thought I'd put it out there to see who wanted it. I was surprised. There was a lot of people that wanted in and it turned into work for me. <laughs> it worked for I me. Bet. Like I had to go do all this banking work and operating agreements and all of this other stuff and yep. turned into work, which I don't like doing all the time right. like that. And I didn't take any money from it. You know, it's, and that's the thing, you know, if you like for me, you do it just to do it. And, um, and, and the, and Justin Donald, who was a, the mutual friend of ours that was helping with it, he didn't take anything out of it either. He did it just yeah. to do it, just to help. And, um, and you start to understand people like him and me and you, like, that's who we are. And you just want to be around more people like that. 
So back to the franchisee yep. that is an underperformer, middle performer. Your advice earlier was, well, no, you, what you did is you get around the top performers. So how do you do that? Your middle performer, bottom performer in, an, in a franchise, Stephen, how do you get around those top performers and what do you do? There, there was an issue at Massage Envy, a transfer rate issue. You know, as a membership-based business, if somebody were to come to my location, if I had a member and they were going to go out to South Dakota and visit your location, there's a there's an inner transfer that takes place to make sure that your folks can get paid um, for doing the work. And mm -hmm. it just, when I looked at it, it, it didn't seem to work. <laughs> we'll just put it that way. And I was so passionate about it. And our regional developer said, you should get on the franchise advisory board because that's where you're going to be heard. And there'll be, you know, seven other people. And you had to be nominated to get on that. So you kind of had to build friends and relationships and talk about what you thought could and needed to be changed. And when I got there, there was a mutual friend that you and I know, John Brovitz, who mm -hmm. was on the opposite side of that thing that I thought needed to be fixed. He thought it was just fine the way it was. And he and I- And he's not a small franchisee. And well, since John not... was the number five massage envy owner, he basically built the brand and, <laughs> and had like 14 <laughs> locations. And here I am, this guy that's been doing it for a few years. And I, you know, I, I didn't think I was an idiot, but I knew I wasn't the smartest guy either. But I was pretty passionate about why I thought this stunted the growth of new franchisees and whatnot. And I really think I got set up because the franchisor didn't really want to deal with me. They're like, well, you know, you should talk to John Brovitz about it. By the end of that meeting, we were like smacking our hand on the table because, you know, you know, John, and he's not going down without a fight. And, and I wasn't going down without a fight. And what was great was he comes up to me at the end of the meeting. He goes, you want, you want to go to dinner and have a beer and talk about it some more? And being a hockey player, that's what we do. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> and that was the first time John and I ever met. And we became best friends after that. And, and awesome. John is like a big brother to me and has been like a big brother through franchising. And that was kind of my first taste of, you know, you gotta, you gotta not be afraid of mm -hmm. the, the people that seem to have all the knowledge or the most successful people. If you just go and ask them a question, more often than not, they're willing to help because that's what I, and again, it goes back to franchising. What I love about it is, People want to share. They, they mm -hmm. really do. They want to see people be successful. They want to see people be successful, but, you know, and I would put myself in the same category. I will share whatever knowledge I have, but you got to go and execute. You mm -hmm. can't expect someone else is going to do it for you. And, and as a regional developer, with my experience with that, I think that was somewhat my first taste of, I can share and tell you the success. I can tell you what to do. I cannot do it for you. You have to have that that grind. I love your shirt that you wear from time to time, Rising Grind. I love that. I got to figure out who, you know, who, oh, is that what you're wearing Dude, right you, now? I've got it on right now. Just send me your address and I'll get you on. Size and address, text okay. it to me after this and you'll have it. one in the mail. I love it. Because, you know, it, and I apologize. You asked a question at the beginning of the podcast and I wrote it down because I don't know that I ever really gave a great answer regarding semi-absentee ownership. I think you have to have two things if you want to be a franchisee. And both actually really helps, but, but one are the two. The first one is you need to have the ability to get in and, and be willing to grind. And it might not be 100% of the time, but even if you're semi-absentee, you got to know what's going on. You got to understand the mechanics of your business and how to coach the person that's doing the operations if you can't be that person yourself. Mm -hmm. And if you can't be that person yourself, and if you have somebody that you're hiring as a GM to do it, you still want to have a very long runway of adequate capital because you don't know what you don't know. And Henry and I learned that lesson with the Amazing Last Studio business. You had said it earlier. Sometimes these business models are presented as can't miss and they're great and they're easy. And Henry and I looked at it and we're like, Looks like Massage Envy to me. It's using the same point of sale system. It's a membership-based business. It's using, you know, estheticians, which we use at Massage Envy as well. It's just a different service. How could it be that hard? It, it couldn't have been further away from Massage Envy. I, I didn't see that coming. 
and you get into it and you're involved with other franchisees. It started as a membership model, but then you had other franchisees that were from a package-based model like European Wax Center. And now you've got like, you know, some people like Nikes and some people like Adidas. Like you're yep. not seeing eye to eye and you're trying to figure out what's the hybrid and how can we work together? And that took two years yep. before people came to an agreement and two years worth of capital to keep that thing alive. You got to have that that rise and grind mentality for sure. And you got to be committed to making it work. And you can't point fingers other than at the mirror and yep. say, if it's, if it's got to be, it starts with me and I got to figure it out. And then you got to build those relationships with the other top people that seem to have figured out little pieces and parts and, and keep sharing at the beginning parts of, of an early franchise system. You get into a mature one, you know, when you go to the conventions, you know, what I used to do is I'd watch the people that were up on stage and I'd see what the names that were being called and I might write it down in my notebook and I'd make it a point to go try to bump into them and build some rapport, introduce myself. And, you know, that was coming from a person that was usually up on stage with, with those folks. But yep. that's that's what you got to do. So if you're in the middle, oh, and it doesn't matter what position, to be honest with you, you know, Eric, it's like... That's the truth. No matter what position, you can always learn more. and. That's why I love being involved with, with your group. We've got high performing folks from their respective franchise uh, systems and some doing bolt on businesses like you talked about and, and pushing the envelope and taking the lessons that they learned from being a franchisee and, and pushing forward. And you know, when you said, what was the thing you thought when your buddy told you you should be an entrepreneur? My first thing was, how would I do that? I, I, I you know, I do have leadership skills, but I don't have any business ideas. I'm not a creative guy. I can follow instructions. I love to cook because I just follow the, the recipe. And then I'll figure out if I want to tweak it here, add some spice there. But I can't start my own business. I wouldn't have the first idea how to do that. But franchising was a really great way to dip your toe into getting an operations manual, looking at all the components that go into it. And... <laughs> And I, I mean, I'm super proud and excited to see the, the Mighty Dog Roofing uh, franchise that, that you're going after because I think that's basically you've taken all this knowledge that you've accumulated over the years and you're like, you know what, this is the next step in my growth. Yep. And I, I might crash and burn, but I doubt it because you've got the stamina and the rise and grind mentality. You're going to figure it out. It's not yep. going to fail. You will figure it out. And you surround yourself with really sharp people like, like was his name Josh? I think Josh Skolnick, yep. And um, Zach. Yep, Zach you know, Butler. You continue to surround yourself with with guys that, you know, can continue to, to help you learn and grow and figure it out. So That's it. And that's why that's why I got was with Josh. I mean, when we first started talking, he was a successful franchisor. I didn't didn't want to have to learn how to be a franchisor on my own. I wanted to be with somebody that's already done that. And wants to wants to grow another brand. The same with Zach. So that's why that's why we got together. One last question for you. This has been fantastic. What advice would you have for somebody that's coming in? Let's say they were new to the mastermind, or they're in franchise and they want to get connected with other franchisees, but they but they don't know if they can really learn from other industries. You know, you're in the beauty space. You're around estheticians. You're around all of that. Like we've got service based people in our mastermind. We've got QSR people in the mastermind. We got you know, all kinds of other, other ones, like it just in the mastermind or in general, what, what's the value in learning from people outside of your specific brand? The value is just really different perspectives. Everybody's coming from different walks of life. Some folks may have grown up going to prep school. Some kids might've grown up from the worst neighborhood. Some folks grew up with entrepreneur parents and uncles, and some folks grew up having access to capital. And some of, you know, it's, everybody has a different perspective. Yet the common bond is that we all want to get better. And, and one thing I, I want to, if you don't mind, I, I want to make an appeal to the franchise community as a whole. And, and this comes from, you know, a, the, a friend of mine, a gal had made a comment to me one time because I said, oh, I got to text Eric or Justin or whatever. And she made the comment. She said, oh, I, I didn't, I wasn't on that. I wasn't, I'm not in the boys club. And at first I got defensive about that. And I was, cause I felt like I was doing something wrong. I'm like, no, it's not, it's not an exclusive group. It, 
like everybody's welcome. These, these is not a group that I belong to. That's like, he man and woman haters club. It's, that's not it. And as I think about, you have three girls. I have three girls. Henry has two girls. And what I would appeal to women out there in the franchise community is join, join this group, join whatever mastermind groups, get after it, you know, be part of the group. It's not a boys club. It's not meant to be a boys club. And that's not something we're trying to make it because everybody has awesome perspectives that they bring. And especially I'd like more women in the group because a lot of the businesses I'm involved in cater to, to women clients out. It makes up the majority of our demographic. It's so true. And, and I love it. Like last night on our, on our call, we had, I think it was, you know, we had a lot of the women we're speaking up. Harry was, was the one asking a lot of questions. And so was uh, Gargi when we were, we had, a, we had a, a special guest talking just about outsourcing stuff through virtual assistants. And he's got a whole program on that. And it was fantastic. But, but those two ladies, they were, they were asking questions and it's so nice to have just a diverse group in every sense of the word that, you know, from brands to demographics, to people, to, you know, areas of the country. And there, I think there's tremendous value in just, that's what I love about it. You, anybody, you should be around people that are outside of your world. That's the point of this, right? Get around people that are outside of your little world, outside of your little franchise, even if it's a big franchise, get outside of that in your community, get to know other franchisees in your community. That's the purpose of the mastermind. You don't have to join a mastermind to do that. You can do it right where you are. Start getting connected with, with franchisees in your own community, network with them, collaborate with them. If they don't have a mentality of being a top performer or want to be a top performer or being a team player or having a positive mindset, don't be around anybody like that because that's just going to drag you down. But this has been great, Stephen. Again, I'm so happy to, uh, to be your friend, have you part of the community, be in other communities with you now. So uh, thanks for coming on the show. Back at you, man. You have no idea how much you've inspired me. And uh, I can't thank you enough, man, for doing what you do. Appreciate Absolutely. You. Anybody wants to uh, check out the, the mastermind, it's Z, Z E E Tribe Mastermind, ztribemastermind.com. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Franchise Secrets Podcast. Whether you're watching or listening, please make sure to subscribe to my YouTube channel and to whatever channel you're listening on. If you want my help with anything from buying a franchise to franchising your business, please visit FranchiseSecrets.com.